Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to lecture two of AI 605. So I'm going to put a quiz right now, and you can take three minutes to work on this. It's going to be actually open for about 10 minutes, so you can take your time. But I'll probably proceed with recapping what we did in the last lecture in the meanwhile. So I'm putting the quiz now, just a second. Uh, professor, I am a, uh, uh, I'm a auditing student from Naver and I wasn't here for the previous class. I was wondering how we submit our answers to these quizzes. Oh, so I'm going to put up the quiz right now on Zoom. You will see it soon, very soon. Yeah, so don't worry about it. Yeah, just just like uh, 10 seconds. Okay, I forgot what the answers were, though. Um, so I think zero, zero, one. Just one second. Very annoying. Okay, so um, I just launched it. So we're gonna have this for about three minutes and
Okay, so you can keep solving the quiz, but and please uh, go to the link that I just shared on the chat. It will have the slide on it. So, but then I'll proceed with the lecture. I'll do the, some recap. And then basically while we recap, you might be able to solve what you couldn't solve. So let's go. But I'll, I'll, I'll leave this quiz open until 4.10 and then we're gonna share it then. Okay, so, uh, okay. Sorry, so actually I forgot to complete the announcement section, but uh, um, assignment will be up next Wednesday and it will be about creating an RNN based classification model. We're gonna learn RNN next class. So probably you will need to stay tuned for now what that, what that is, but um, it's good for you to know what that is, what the assignment is. So RNN next class, basically next week until Wednesday. And number four is that the video is up. Lecture one video is up. I put this. I put the link on the um, on the course website. You can take a look. I'm gonna post the video on the same playlist. So uh, please, uh, please uh, go to the playlist whenever you want to take a look at the uh, previous lectures that you might have missed. Okay. So any questions? All right, so lecture one recap. So we went through a few basic things about deep learning and I said that it's okay that if you remember this, but uh, you, if you have trouble understanding it, please consider taking AI 501 or 502 first. The first was calculus. So we talked about how we can compute derivative of polynomials, exponentiation and algorithm, um, I think, so if the pose polynomial was that ax squared plus bx plus c, then, then y prime or dy dx is equal to two ax plus b. And similar things for exponentiation, y equal ex, then dy over dx will be actually equal to the uh, original y. And if y is a log x, then dy, dx is equal to one over x. Here the log is natural log. And we talk about chain rule. And um, in the single variable case, you will just look at basically this part, right? But then it, when we are, uh, when we're talking about uh, multivariables that actually in, uh, that, that are between two variables here, y and x, then you will have to actually do addition for each variable. So that's, basically more generalized form because if B is always um, zero or constant, then um, this will be uh, zero. So zero times zero will be zero. That's why this will be not, it will be just zero, right? But um, so you can think of this as a generalized form of a single variable case. Okay, so going to the next one. So we talk about linear algebra. When you're trying to multiply vectors, then uh, x times a plus y times z plus z times c, ax plus by plus cz. And then when you're doing matrix multiplication, then this gets multiplied to here and that goes here. And then uh, this gets multiplied to this and that goes here. So rule of thumb was that if you multiply a matrix of size Q, Q comma R and R comma S, then the size of the resulting matrix will be Q comma S. It's like canceling out whatever is in between them. And of course, then it is clear that you cannot multiply Q comma R to say 
some other value than R comma and S, right? Because they'll have mismatch. In that case, those two matrix cannot be multiplied to each other. And it's also worth noting that it means that if you want to transform a matrix of a size Q comma R to Q comma S, then you basically want to have a transition matrix, which is R comma S. That's from the from dimension to two dimension. So it's a handy rule. I mean, it's something that you wanna always keep, it, keep in your, your mind for uh, easiness when you're transforming layers uh, in your networks. And last thing was the fact that in machine learning, what we are really interested in is estimating a function for a given input and output relationships. And that can be as easy as something like predicting height given weight, predicting if an image is a cat or dog, or predicting if what the next word is, which is basically language model. And in many cases, in fact, we know something about the task, right? And then we want to use this knowledge to parameterize or basically describe the function or um, define what possible solutions so that you can prefer or you can prioritize one solution over another. You're, when you're given uh, uh, input and output pairs, because what, the function is really nothing more than, you know, domain and range. And there is some mapping between these two. And you never know what the relationship will be. The function doesn't have to have a predefined, well-defined, relationship between domain and the range, it just is basic a mapping of uh, input to output. But we want to describe the function or parameterize function by basically constructing a model, right? And then that model can be, for instance, something like a linear model. In this case, then we're assuming that the output y is in linear relationship with the input x with this equation ax plus b. In this case, is if we assume this relationship, then we have parameterized the function. And here the parameters that we are optimizing for are the um, A and B. These are the parameters. And we call this inductive bias. Okay, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm now going to end the poll. Hopefully you had, you had enough time. So we had 50 participants and um, I'm gonna actually download the results. So just a second. Okay, good. All right, so. All right, so I'm, and I just ended the poll and I'm gonna share the results. Actually, I just decided to share the results. I think it should be fine because it should be anonymous for everyone. Um, so um, question number one. Yep, so I think 82% 80 of people got right. So it's two, let's go through it. Um, so why is it two? So you can actually solve this in different ways. So you might, you, you can also use the uh, product rule that you might have learned in your calculus class. In fact, the, the product rule for derivative is actually a special form of uh, the partial derivative. You can think of it that way. So we're gonna solve two ways. One is that we know the product rule, which is um, solution one number one is, um, we know that y prime is equal to a prime times b plus a times b prime. But also we know that partial y over partial x is equivalent to partial um, a over partial x times partial, no, my bad. Partial y over partial a times partial a over partial x plus partial y over partial b times partial b over partial x. And you see, it's quite um, similar because actually exactly the same because 
we know that partial y over partial a in this case will be what? Just b, right? And you know that partial y over partial b is just a. So that's why we are uh, basically these two and these two are the same. So, and then of course the A prime is equ equivalent to partial A over partial X and B prime is equivalent to partial B over partial X. So they're actually same in this case. And then, so what are e each values? So we know that then um, in either cases, then um, we're gonna use solution number two though, because that's what we learned. So we know then partial Y over partial X is equal to, equal to um, B times, partial a over partial x, which is just um, 2x plus z1, right? And then we want to add this to a times e, e to the power of x in um, partial, partial x is e to the power of x, same, right? And then if we um, substitute x equal to zero, then we know that a will be equal to uh, one. And this will be equal to one, uh, one, two, right? Because e to the power of zero is one. And then this will be one and this will be one. So it will be one plus one, which is two. So the answer is two. And uh, quiz number two, what is the upper left corner uh, uh, number of? So basically we're talking about, it's good to see this as And then we're interested in this number, right? We know that the resulting matrix size will be two by two because um, we know that this will be what? Uh, we uh, Q, R, and R, S, right? And then we know that the L will be um, canceled out. So the resulting will be always Q and S and here in the square matrix, so it'll be just two, over two, two by two matrix. And we know that also five, seven, and one, two should be vector multiplied, which means five corresponds to one and then seven corresponds to two. So five times one. Um, so wait, uh, so A is equal to five times one plus uh, seven times two, which is equal to 19, which actually everyone got right. So that's really great. And finally, um, inductive bias is a bias that exists when the sample training data does not correctly represent the population, which should be avoided if possible. So I think many people were confused and the answer is false. So at least we got more people right than wrong, uh, but I think many were confused. So what is this? What is, what is this? Well, actually, this is not inductive bias. This is actually description of sampling bias. So it's false because this is actually sampling bias. And I don't wanna say that certain bias is better than the other or good, or good or bad, but then in general, sampling bias is something that we want to avoid if possible, but inductive bias is actually something that has to be, has to exist in a model to actually work because without zero inductive bias, it means that you're searching over the entire possible function space, which is infinite, right? So it's really impossible to, find a good solution. So inductive bias always ex exists. Even in an end-to-end -end deep learning model, inductive bias exists. The fact that the deep learning model is hierarchical, it's a layer after layer and something is building upon another. So if there's some structure, then it ha always has inductive bias. So um, hopefully that makes sense for uh, most of you. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing this. So your result, your quiz result don't actually count towards your grade. So don't worry about actually giving wrong answer. It just, what matters is that you actually participate so that uh, your attendance is taken, but then um, I'm not taking attendance for the first two weeks. Okay, so that's good. All right, so let's go into lecture two. So now we just saw that um, if we want to predict weight given height or the other way, I think maybe I said the other way in the previous slide, it doesn't really matter. But suppose we want to predict weight given height. So in this case, then height will be 
what? X and weight will be, wait, no, the other way, sorry. In this case, then height will be, yeah, height will be X and weight will be Y. And as I said, it, it, I'm not saying that the, there is a linear relationship between these two. So it's really important to note this. I think it's like machine learning 101. I'm not saying the weight is linearly related to height. It's just that we're assuming there's a linear relationship. At the end, it might not be linear. Probably, I, I don't think it's linear actually, because you know, if weight goes up like to 300 kilograms, doesn't mean that your height will be super uh, like tall, right? Because you can also grow uh, you know, horizontally, not just vertically, right? So, um, so I'm not saying there is actually a linear relationship. I'm saying that let's assume that there is a linear relationship and that's our model. That's our um, assumption or that's our inductive bias. Then we can formulate the problem as y equal wx plus b where all numbers here are scalar. And of course here x and y are variables. And these two are what? Parameters. That we want to optimize for. Okay, so then what we want to do usually is that basically then um, we want to first plot this. So suppose the height we can plot like this. And then suppose the weight. Right. Then we can pl plot that 160 height goes to 55, which is probably here. Um, 168 goes to 62, which is probably here. And 173 goes to um, 66, which is probably here. And then 180 goes to 75, so it's probably here. So luckily, we're seeing some linear relationship. That's what we want to find, but um, now the question is, the machine learning, machine learning question here will be, okay, how can we find that? How can we find a, a good line? And if we want to find a good line, that means that we want to first define what a good line is. Does it mean that it just has to be a good line to us? That it looks good? Or does it mean that there is some um, quantitative measure for a good line? And that's what we're gonna see. And, um, but then there is one more issue actually that suppose that we want to handle or we want to put more inputs to this function, not just a height, but maybe a gender is a really important factor determining height because usually um, males are taller than females. So uh, how can we actually put this information? Because it's not so clear if we are, operating in this real, real, real space where everything is number, but then male, female is not a number. So that's uh, something that we have to think about a bit. And in fact, one of the easiest way to do this is that if the input is categorical, which means we know for sure that input is coming from a fixed size set. In this case, this set will be female and male. Right, two labels, um, not labels, but two, two possible categories, then we can assign a one hot vector for each category and use the one hot vector as the input instead. So for instance, we can define female as a vector of one comma zero and define male as zero comma one. So what does that mean? So for instance, now we have uh, again X here, but we can call this now X one. and we have y, and then we can call this x2. But um, what we really want is not this female or male, but we want to have a vector that corresponds to this, uh, this category, which will be 1 comma 0, 0 comma 1, 1 comma 0, and 0 comma 1. Then how many numbers do we have as the input? We have 160, I mean height, one, one number for height, and two numbers for the, 
um, the gender. So we have three inputs. So it's no more scale value. That's why it has to be a vector. X has to be a vector. So that's why actually uh, I bold printed this X. So X is now, it's a column vector, which means it has a, a three dimensions in the row dimension and then one column, right? And what will be the dimension of W in this case? Well, you have to multiply W to X, which means W has to be the other way, one comma three, one, one times three. So, which means you're talking about some um, scale value here, which is, You have three values, W1, W2, and W3, and then you have uh, three values here too. X1 and X2, comma one and X2, comma two. So X2, comma one will be the first value of this vector, which should be something like this, and then X2, comma two will be this. And then we have B, which is also scalar because the output is scalar. And then what do we have? So then we'll have W1, x1 plus w2 x2 comma 1 plus w3 x2 comma 2 plus b y equal 2. So what we're assuming is that our prediction will be following this linear relationship in this case. So now you see that how we can actually handle multiple input variables and also when the input is categorical and probably uh, this is something you already learned, but please, um, I hope you um, don't have any trouble recalling these things or understanding these concepts. And not just the input can be a vector, but it's also possible that the output can be a vector. So for instance, we can also design a model whose output is a vector when if we want to predict weight and leg length, given height and gender. In that case now, we have three dimensions for the input, just like the previous example, but we have two dimensions for the output. So in this case, then first dimension will be what? The um, weight, but second dimension of the output will be the leg length. So then what's, what's different now then? Now the difference is now then the W is no more one, uh, three by, uh, one by three matrix, but it has to be now um, two by three matrix, which means you are now predicting y1 and y2, which is you have uh, six values here. And then you have uh, x1, x2, comma 1, x, comma 2, plus b1 and b2. Now bias is also a vector. That's why we both printed here. OK, so if you actually uh, try to solve this solution, then you will have two equations, which is about y1 and y2. And I think you remember in, in your linear algebra class that you can try to solve this um, um, set of equations. Of course, it, it's, there isn't a single um, you know, solution to this because we have a lot of variables, more variables than the, um, the, the uh, number of equations, but um, now you get the point, what it means to have a, um, two outputs. Okay, so now it's good. So we now just discussed how we can model uh, vector input, vector output relationship. But we're just, in this case, we're just defining them, right? So we haven't really talked about anything about how we can actually find a solution. And, but actually before going into that, um, I wanna just touch on one more thing. So then what is neural network? Uh, neural network is nothing more than, in fact, Your network is nothing more than a layer or a set of layers that just consist of um, these linear transformations. So what we just saw is actually just single layer neural network where we have uh, two inputs and uh, three inputs and two, uh, two outputs. So uh, actually I show you a neural network diagram on the right, but the, what we just did is equivalent to
we have a uh, um, three inputs, and then we have two output nodes, and of course, every node is connected. And now you might be wondering, so what is here um, the what are the weights and where are the um, the um, variables? So here the nodes are variables. So here the nodes are variables. So here uh, the this is x. So it's one way to actually create a diagram of what we just saw in the previous slide. This equation. And here, this will be y. And where are the weights? So these are the weights. This all the arrows are the weights. Where are the biases? Bias is something that just adds to this y that's not really depicted in the diagram because you can just assume that the bias always exists. Sometimes people just actually ignore that um, in the diagram, but you can think of as biases here. You can just something that you just add to this y after you multiply with w. So of course um, you might rather consider um, creating a model that's not just one, it's not just one step of uh, this W transformation, but maybe we can have a two matrices. So maybe we have a first layer being called W and maybe we want to uh, create a, a second layer that's I'll call Z maybe. Then in that case, how does the uh, graph looks like? So and then we, we can actually set an arbitrary number of uh, intermediate layers because that's just what we, we can choose whatever we want to. So what I mean by is that we still have to have a same input because input and outputs are actually fixed. We can have also two outputs, which should be also fixed. So these are actually input and uh, output variables. So they, you cannot change this, but you might also, maybe you might have like uh, four intermediate layers. And let's just call this um, H. It's just like a, you know, um, hallucinated variables, basically. It's not uh, input or output, it's basically latent variables, people call it. And then we can just do the same um, weight, right? So in this case, every um, node will be connected. So like that and like that, right? So then we can call this the first one. I'll just call it um, here, this first W1 and this I'll call this W2. Then what is a size of W1? Size of W1 is three, two, four, right? And then size of W2 will be four times two. And of course we'll have some bias to it. Then at the end, then the equation will be we're saying that um, we first have to apply W1 to X and then put some bias B1. So it will be W1 X plus B1. And then we want to multiply this by W2 and B2, right? So this is exactly multi-layer neural network. And that's we just had we just saw two layers of neural network here. The each layer corresponds to the the each weight or transformation. So um, I think, but then it really uh, depends on how you count this because sometimes people count this as three layers because you have input layer, hidden layer, and output layer. Um, I don't think it's there's a really single um, best or single uh, way to call this. But I think people, what we usually do is that they actually call this, for instance, um, um, this being the layer, like on the right side, input layer is usually not called input layer in many cases. You just call this weights and the output of the weights to be a one layer. So this will be hidden layer here. And then this will be output layer. So 
it's in many cases it's not super clear what the terminal loss means, but I think it's a bit more confusing if we say this has three layers. But um, whatever, we can call this three layers if we're counting the number the layer as nodes. But then we can call this two layers if we're counting layer as a uh, the transformation itself. There isn't really um you know a single answer to this. Something everyone agrees. Although I think this these days like people uh, like it to like uh, like to actually speak in uh, in terms of coding or how you would code on PyTorch or TensorFlow and in this case we will have uh, actually two transformations which means you will have a uh, two linear uh, and then that layer um, PyTorch code so it makes more sense to say it's two layers. Anyways, um, I digressed a bit, but but there is one problem with this. So what is that? And can you guess what that is? The problem is that, so I'm gonna actually try to solve this, um, y equal w2, w1x plus b1 plus b2. So actually, if you try to solve this, right, then it becomes, it's very easy, right? So what is it? So you're basically saying w1, uh, w2, w1x plus, W2, B1 plus B2, right? And now you might wonder, so because we, we, are, we, we can choose anything, we're just, uh, these parameters, W and B are something that we can choose, they can be anything. Then you can just, you can just uh, substitute W2 times W1 um, with W3, and you can substitute W2 times B1 plus B2 with, B3. Then you just create a one layer or a single layer neural network, although you actually made it more complex initially. So what happened? So I think everyone knows the answer hopefully, but when you just do linear transformation multiple times, um, it doesn't actually change what the model, what the uh, what your model can actually do. Um, in, in a sense of uh, I mean, its capability, because you can only model linear relationship with linear layers because of uh, adding more linear layers only makes it linear, doesn't make it nonlinear. So you cannot, for instance, uh, draw anything like uh, even as simple as parabolic relationship between a curve, like, uh, you know, polynomial relationship. You, you cannot even model something like this because this is nonlinear, right? So it's very sad because you might want to do something more complex than linear, but then just adding what more layers to this will not um, help you at all. And so what is the solution to this uh, problem? Uh, the solution is that you have to put something called activation function. So activation functions enable nonlinearity in each layer. And there are actually three most popular activation functions, um, namely sigmoid, tanh, and ReLU. In fact, these days I think it's very um, actually you know not just that, but I can also add uh, softmax to this too, because although it's very rare that softmax is um, actually well. In the traditional neural networks, softmax was only used at the um, uh, at the last minute. I'm gonna come back to the softmax later. But you're gonna see why I meant that softmax is traditionally only for the um, 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 basically making a certain output into probabilistic distribution and only at the upper layer. But it is clear that this actually changed a lot since the introduction of attention mechanism where attention mechanism actually relies on softmax and because of softmax that because softmax introduces nonlinearity you can actually build a pretty complex model with only softmax and linear transformation although um, people don't do that actually they put um, relu to but uh, we're gonna get to that later when we're going into attention mechanism but for now um, you can think of this as an, a layer that also can be called, considered as an activation function. 
Softmax is, um, but uh, it's easier to see the other functions because of, unlike Softmax, sigmoid, tan h, and value are all, all element wise operations, which means you basically just apply this element wise to each value in this vector. So suppose that um, you want to apply the sigmoid, right, uh, to a you know non scalar vector, then it's just sigmoid of x1, sigmoid x2, and sigmoid x3. So very easy, right? So you don't have to really think about um, the interactions between these elements, but then softmax is not. So that's why it's different. And it's a bit more, I would say, complex to actually visualize. But sigmoid, so as you see what uh, the equation for sigmoid is one over one plus e to the power of uh, negative x. And it's actually all also um, sometimes sigmoid is also written as e to the power of x over e to the power of x plus one. And you might wonder, okay, why are there two di different um, definitions? And you can take a second look and you will see that these two are actually equivalent because uh, if you just multiply e to the power of x to the both sides of um, this sigmoid, um, then you will see that you will get this uh, e to the power of x plus one. And we'll soon see that actually probably you already know, but this is actually also equivalent to softmax with um, um, constant value being the, uh, the second option. But uh, we'll, get, we'll come back to that. But then for now, you will see that this is um, um, a scalar function. And then it looks like this. So, if it's at zero, it'll be 0 0.5. And when, as it approaches infinity, this will be approaching one. And as, as it, it reach, uh, approaches negative infinity, then it will reach, uh, approach um, zero. So what's the best uh, application for this in general, other than the activation? This will be very good for uh, making a certain model outputting probabilistic distribution, right? Because they are always between zero and one. And 10 H is a bit different from sigmoid in that uh, it looks very similar, but now the um, the you your negative uh, as you approach negative infinity, you actually approach negative one. So this is actually now symmetric, unlike sigmoid um, over the x axis. And when the x value is zero, then it's also zero again. And we have ReLU here, which is very simple, um, max between zero and X. So which means then if it's bigger than zero, then it's just a linear function. So it doesn't actually do anything, just uh, basically Y equal just X, right? But then when it's smaller than zero, then it will be just zero, so flattened out. So it's a very simple function and you might think like, how can that actually make any difference? But in fact, ReLU is like really the, really the building block for modern deep learning. In fact, I think now we can safely say that not just the uh, you know, image classification or image models, which rely on ReLU. Now the, all the transformer models also rely on the, um, something similar to ReLU. Actually, they make this uh, into JALU or some other forms that's a bit smoothened form of ReLU, uh, something like that. But um, it's very similar to ReLU. And you can think of this as like a very, uh, very fundamental building block in the modern deep learning. And by just putting this on top of the output of each node, you can make it nonlinear, very simple, right? So what I mean by is that um, if you look at the previous equation, uh, y equal w2, w1x plus b1 plus b2. Um, so originally this was, but then if you put this activation, for instance, sigmoid, then this will be, um, W2, if you just put sigmoid in the middle of a first layer and second layer, then it will be W1X plus B1 plus B2. And clearly you cannot make this into linear, a simple linear function anymore because of the sigmoid function. Okay, so I'm gonna actually, we're gonna have a, a short break of five minutes up until 5 p.m., oh no, 4, 4.50. I think I was a bit over time and we're gonna use the rest of 25 minutes to um, go over the uh, the rest of the materials in this lecture. Yeah, see you soon. Uh, I'm gonna answer a question when I come back.
Okay, there was an extra. Yeah, I'm gonna come back to your questions after we come back. Okay, welcome back. So I'm gonna go through a few questions that I missed. Okay, so first is from Yasuo. Do we assume the absence of activation function? So yeah, I'm actually, I think, was when, when I was actually talking about uh, non-activation function, linear 
model. So yeah, um, probably now you get it now that yeah, it was a surprise, hopefully. <laughs> Um, and Hiju asked the question, can you tell me how to choose one out of those activation functions or some tips when building a model? Okay, it's a very good question. So in general, um, in the recent, um, so actually activation function in a nutshell doesn't have to actually be one of these either. It can be anything. It can be very complex function too that just makes the model very um, non-linear. But it's also we don't want to mess up the original function too much, right? So we just want to keep the um, some sort of a linear correlation or the positive correlation. The fact that as x goes up, then we also want to make sure that y goes up or at least doesn't go down. Kind of monotonic thing. So. That's a rule of thumb when you're designing or choosing an activation function. And these three are very popular. One of the reasons is that actually they are very convenient when um, we do, when we take um, basically their derivative in the log space, for instance. So uh, for instance, the, um, because of uh, their, their actually use the, uh, you know, natural, natural exponentiation, taking a, taking a derivative of these is very easy. And still, it's very powerful and also very bounded. Um, uh, what do you call activation? So I'm not saying these three should be the um, only choices you should consider, but they, these three also have nice properties. Sigmoid, for instance, I told you that the it has a nice property of uh, being between zero and one. So sigmoid is oftentimes used um, when you're trying to use the output for, uh, for instance, if you want to decide whether you want to gate another output or not, this we will see in the LSTM, which is uh, which uses sigmoid a lot. 10H is actually probably, uh, was actually uh, the, the choice for everyone by default because 10H is, is very good in that it doesn't actually change the sign of the input, it's always, if the input is negative, then the, the output is also negative. It just changes scale. So 10H has been the, the, the actually the choice um, for many early deep learning years, but people found that in image classification, for instance, that ReLU is much more effective in terms of uh, the, um, the how fast the model converges and also uh, actually how good the model can be because um, it only introduces the bound to the negative side. So the positive side, it can be as big as it wants. It doesn't interrupt the X much. So it's, it's value is actually something that you wanna try first if, this, if it doesn't have an issue these days, I think, or something similar to that, such as Jalu. Yeah. Another question is that, um, could the fact that the derivative of value in the range of X small than zero is equal to zero relate to problems? I heard that due to this reason, ReLU in its initial form is not used anymore. Is that true? Um, well, so as you said, yeah. So ReLU doesn't have any um, slope be below zero, right? So if you actually differentiate this uh, ReLU function, um, I'll show you. So suppose that, y go to ReLU of x, then what is uh, y prime? Well, y prime is one if x is positive and zero if x is negative, right? And this is a problem because in the initial, uh, when you initialize your parameters, it, it turns it might turn out that actually you are in the um, negative range of the um, inputs and then your derivative will be always zero. So that means you will not move at all. So that's an issue, uh, but then it's not always an issue because you, not, you don't just have one parameter, but you actually have multiple parameters and they are also interconnected with uh, multiple layers of hierarchy. So it turns out that even if it's like ReLU, the model still trains. So it's incorrect to say that ReLU, it doesn't work at all. It's just that people found that uh, it's good to some, it's good, usually good to actually make this into, for instance, um, a little bit of slope like this like that, for instance, or it can be also something like, um, 
like that. In this case, then it's not actually flattened out, but um, but uh, there are several use cases in the um, um, transformer. I think uh, it still is dominant that we use uh, Jalu or something similar. People like come up with different activations all the time. Looks like this. So the approach is zero actually both negative, but then there's some like hiccup here. So um, I'll actually show you how it looks like. So yeah, I think it's probably not easy to actually import this image, but then, um, so Jello looks like that. And then if you take a derivative of this, then how it looks like is something like this. Derivative will be, um, it's uh, it approaches zero, but then it kind of have a small hiccup. Oh, what's wrong? So it's like that. Yeah, you can probably take a look at the uh, Google. This is, oh yeah, I didn't know how to spell it. Maybe Jello, G-E-L-U, Jello function. Okay, hopefully, please let me know anytime if you have any more question. So let's move on. Okay, so with the introduction of activation function, now, we're able to model more complex relationships than linear relationship. That's a good thing, but you might wonder how complex that can, uh, can, can we model? And it turns out that um, if we can, uh, given a target error epsilon, suppose we want to create a model that actually, uh, you know, fits, model that fits the training data within this error uh, margin, it is possible to construct uh, many layers of neural network, but still finite size such that the error between the output of this neural network and the ground truth in the training data is less than epsilon. And actually I'm using the word epsilon because uh, that's like a more mathematical term. Maybe it's familiar to you if you actually took a um, math class called real analysis. Actually, I recommend taking that if you're really interested in this kind of uh, you know, theorems and proving things, but um, you can actually use some of the techniques we uh, actually know from these uh, math, uh, real analysis, um, this blue book from Rudin. It's very, um, very, very hard, actually, very hard class, actually, but it's a very interesting class too. But uh, what we call this is universal approximation theorem, the fact that we can actually get close as much as we want with a finite number of layers. So it's very, um, very encouraging because that means that, okay, if we can just control the number of layers. So um, of course, it is also important to actually go wider, which means we want to have a many latent nodes to make the model better. But actually making more latent nodes with single layer wouldn't actually make it possible to approximate anything. That's a really important thing. The fact that we have to actually have to have a depth, we have to have a hierarchical structure is really one of the really critical um, concepts in deep learning. And that's why it's called deep learning because the layers get deep. It, and if, if we get layers deep, then we know mathematically that you can actually approximate anything you want to from real space, real vector space to real vector space. Of course, uh, we're by, uh, of course we're assuming everything now still uh, to something like uh, you know vector space of size a to vector space of size b. We're talking about the function between these two real vector space. And that's very good because we don't have to, you know, come up with a super complex function that we don't even know how to create, we just have to actually stack the same, ki same kind of layers multiple times to be able to approximate that uh, function of fun the relationship that you want to model. And that means that we can just choose this 
without um, you know worrying about whether the model is capable at the end. At least we can choose this paradigm, paradigm of deep learning. That's why actually deep learning was um, one of the reasons why deep learning got really popular. But we don't. It, it, but then what we have just talked about is just about the existence of the solution, right? Um, there is a problem because talking about whether a solution exists and whether you can find a solution is a different thing, right? And in order to find a solution, then we first have to actually um, define what the how we can compute the error. Because if you want to actually um, go back to this universal approximate approximation theorem, and then we define the target error here. What is target error though? We never defined it yet, right? In this class. So because we want to minimize that error. And that is something that we want to optimize for. So we call that um, loss function. And we, can, we want to measure that by defining as the difference between the model's output. It could be either scalar or vector and the ground truth. And this is loss function. And of course, um, this word difference is very, very um, overloaded term. It can mean a lot of different things. So, if we want to be more mathematically rigorous, then we want to be very precise about what the definition is. Um, and one of the most obvious choices is Euclidean distance, in which um, you have two vectors. Um, Okay, so I had a question whether does UAT satisfy the universal approximate theorem satisfy regardless of activation function? Um, so maybe I do not know this really well, but as far as I know, um, there are certain class of activation functions that I think we can say yes, but probably I think every nonlinearity, yeah, I think so, yeah. But I can double check and let you know next class. As far as no, I think so. But even if it doesn't, it's probably a very small class of activation functions that actually um, violates the UAT. I think, for instance, maybe you might, um, the, the activation function has to be something like, I don't know, um, some, some characteristics. But I'll actually take a look and then let you know next class. Thanks. Good question, though. Mm. And um, so, yep. So that's and then what, what's the what, what's one of the uh, easiest obvious ways to actually define the difference? And it's actually including distance between the outputs, right? So we have a um, model output and the ground truth output. We can say both are vectors. Uh, P and Q, that we just measure the distance between those two in Euclidean space, which is just a 2D, basically 2D, uh, I mean, not 2D, but L2 distance. And you compute, I think, very familiar to you, right? Square roots of uh, summation of these uh, differences. But in practice, what we're trying to is just minimize this, right? Not um, exactly compute the distance. So we don't really have to compute these square roots because. Um, square root function is monotonic. So if you just minimize whatever is inside the square root, then you'll probably minimize the square root too. So uh, we just actually remove the square root by squaring it, squaring it. And we can also usually average the terms. Um, well, here the average terms actually doesn't mean this dimension, but the example space, because um, uh, oh, actually it can mean both. I mean, we can average uh, this dimension space, but also we can average what? The example space, right? So this P and Q are just one example, but we might have several examples. So for example, two, we might have P2 and P Q2. So at the end, if you just compute the distances between um, all different P's and Q's, then what you're gonna go end up in terms of uh, terms, it will be basically, um, you wanna uh, compute P1 minus uh, Q1 square, uh, P2 minus the Q1 square, and then you go to like P, you know, N minus Q1 square. Actually, my bad. But, 
probably I'll have to use superscript. So I'm going to use superscript for different examples. So this is all example number one. But you can also compute what the squared error for example number two, dimension one. Oh, sorry. And then we go up to Pn of uh, two. Square. So then this will be what? This dimension will be n, row will be n, and um, we have a uh, suppose um, big n examples, then this will be big n. So, and then we can just average these all the terms in this matrix to compute the mean squared error because we're basically taking a mean of these square er squared errors. So that's one way to actually find uh, the loss between, of course, not just one example. Uh, one pair of input and output, but many pairs of input and outputs. That's what we usually do when we're training a model, right? Okay, so we define what the loss is. And I told you that, okay, it doesn't mean that still existence of solution does not mean that finding it is easy. And because we have to search through this entire parameter space and find a set of parameters that gives minimum error or minimum MSC in this case, right? But uh, another problem is that even if we are able to find a solution that guesses every training example right, it does not mean that it will get every test example right. And in fact, in the traditional machine learning, uh, I cannot say this is true anymore when the model gets big and the data gets all really big, but the, in the traditional machine learning, this kind of behavior happens that your um, training loss goes down, but your validation loss actually uh, starts to go up at some point. So in, uh, ideally you want to actually stop here, right? Because your validation loss is what you really want to maximize for at the end or test loss. So when actually it does get uh, a lot of training examples right, but then it doesn't get a lot of validation examples right, then you call that uh, behavior overfitting. And that's why machine learning is really hard because in fact, creating a model that guesses every training example right is a very trivial, very easy. So can you think of such a model? I mean, if you just give me uh, any number of training examples, it's very easy to make a model that can guess every example right. And the answer is actually quite trivial actually too. It's just that you have to create, just store the training example in your model, right? And then just whenever a new example comes in, you just find uh, a instance that's actually uh, same as, or maybe similar to your training example, and then just get the output uh, uh, get the corresponding, corresponding output as your model's output. In fact, this is actually a very good um, model too that's used a lot. So you store your training examples and whenever a new example comes in, you try to find the example in the training data that's closest in the input space and then just output the corresponding output. Um, that's called a K, a K nearest neighbor search or nearest neighbor uh, search model. So you basically just search for the, the, the closest instance and then just um, give the output to it. So it's called actually also instance-based learning because you basically just use your training instances um, to get the output. And I'm not saying it's bad, but then I'm saying that it shouldn't be something that um, be merited because it's a very easy thing to do, doing getting everything in the training right. So you should never, that's why you should never and never um, obviously uh, use your test data as a training examples, but it's very, because it's very trivial to actually get your um, test examples right. If you, if you see that during training. So what's challenging is actually how we can create a model that only trains on the training data and still does well on unseen test data. And this ability is called generalization. And I'm not, um, you know, I'm not over, I'm not exaggerating. It is actually the goal of machine learning. And traditionally, 
we believe that a small degree of freedom, a small number of parameters basically, with a good inductive bias, like saying that this is a linear relationship, is the key to generalization. But in fact, uh, it is now not true anymore. So, so actually, this is really important because still many machine learning, um, I think, especially like um, you know materials that you can find online. Of course, there are really good materials too. But sometimes, actually, people um, look into, I would say, something that's more than like two or three years old. Then, then you might see uh, sayings like, "Okay, uh, model overfits when." You have a small degree of large degree of freedom so we want to actually you know make it smaller and then we also want to you know um well we don't want to make the model big but then um we can safely say now that it's not true anymore um actually especially actually neural networks especially bigger ones when you get to a big enough uh, scale then we are actually seeing that model almost never overfits so it's very actually fascinating and we don't really know why. Um, and in fact, I actually refer this paper, but this is also relatively uh, not super recent. Um, there are more actually um, papers. I, we're going to come back to this probably at the uh, around the end of this course uh, when we get to uh, GPT-3 and how actually what motivate the, uh, the world to delve into super large models. But uh, you can now take this for now as granted um, that large models is not necessarily bad or it's bad against the um, generalization. And um, so, but we're going to come back to that. Yep. And I think probably, um, yep, I think. I'll probably stop at this point because we only have two minutes left, but I just want to make sure how people are doing with uh, whatever we uh, discussed today. Um, and let me know if you have any question. So I'm going to say we got up to here. I'm going to set up a poll. So a, I'm going to ask you how it was today's lecture. And then uh, basically, I want to see if uh, I understood. I know or understand everything. Um, I had some troubles. Um, and number three is I should probably not take this. I'm, I'm, not, I'm probably not ready for this class. Uh, okay, so please uh, go ahead and then Okay, just, yeah. This poll is just um, something that I just take a look, so you don't have to worry about. Um, uh, this will not be related to anything like attendance or grading. It will be helpful for me to actually get to know you. Okay, I'll end the poll right now. And sure. So looks like most people, but I think uh, understood 
and some people had some trouble so i'll try to see uh, where i can improve but it's good that um, no one is actually not ready for this class so yeah thanks all everyone so i'm gonna stop sure actually i'm gonna download results um all right so um yeah thank you for your time today we're gonna see you next monday thanks a lot